Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Sean Shepard Show. I'm Sean Shepard, your host, and today we got a very special guest, a very good friend of mine who I've known for many, many years. Uh, this is Carol Ann, and she is a vet technologist. Thank you for coming on the show today. I'm just going to call you CA because that's what I normally do for short. Are you okay with that? Oh, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yes. Um, so, CA, I've known you for many years, and I just also want to say you have been a great friend for myself and others in my family, and you. <laughs> you are um, just an amazing person all around. And I'm really happy to have you on today so that we can learn what it's like to be a vet technologist, how you got started. Um, now, you are retired from that. Is that correct right now? Semi. I still Semi retired. Yeah, I do some volunteer work with an uh, organization in town here that helps okay. uh, pe people who really can't afford uh, vet work, um, vet care, sorry. Um, I help a, a dear friend of ours. Yes. Yeah, she gets she's it, it's nice just to keep my hand in on things like that, but uh, not not practicing at the moment. Right. So she she's asked you to to help out with her. Mm -hmm. That's yep. right. There's yeah. Several other technicians, technologists as yeah. well as a, uh, we have an one incoming vet and one um, retired uh, veterinary okay. pathologist who's helping us as well. So what, just so some people may not know what that is. I'm not even sure I know what it is. What a is a veterinary vet patho <laughs> same what is as a pathologist? <laughs> is it same as in human medicine. Uh, pathologists okay. um, basically study disease processes, uh, okay. tumors, anything from um, bacteria. They diagnose diseases and processes in okay. order to give us a treatment plan. Okay. Like cancer. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Um, it's, um, and you know what, I, I know that, that she's going to come on the show at some point and I know she's going to give a big spiel about all of that. Yeah. So that's going to be really great. Um, can you, so let's start off with, uh, how did you get into like, how long ago did you get into, um, this, where did you start? What made you want to get into this? I guess. Long let's hear the time story. ago. So, um, I grew up on a lake, actually the lake that I live on now, and okay. uh, met several friends in the area because they used to walk their horses by, and I just was and th just so thrilled to be able to watch a horse walk by my cottage. Got sure. to know these girls. They were about my age, and one of them in particular, Nicole, introduced me uh, to the world of horses. She taught me how to ride. She taught me how to groom. She taught me um, horse care, horse feeding, ba uh, basically the horse 101. Yeah. Uh, then she also took me to 4-H, um, which I'm not sure if it's all over Canada. I believe it is, but 4-H is um, for young people who want to kind of learn how to care for animals, um, sure, horses, yeah, cows, okay. all kinds of things. Um, and it just, it piqued my interest even more. So she used to pick me up on the horse every morning when I was at the cottage in the summer. And yeah. I, it really started my interest growing. And not only in that, uh, cats and dogs as well. So of course, all through high school, you don't take anything like that in high school. You have no idea. But when you go to a guidance counselor, you kind of tell them, this is what I'm interested in. Well, I was also yeah. interested in art, but all the art I did was drawing animals. <laughs> so it was like, anyways, guidance counselor showed me a few different things, sure. um, career path wise, you know, you could yeah. go vet, you could go vet technologist. I didn't even know that existed at the time. So yeah. I spent a day at a local veterinary clinic and that kind of clinched it for me. And then applied after that, I was accepted into three different programs and I narrowed it down to, didn't really want to do large animal. Wasn't really my yeah. thing, even though I did sure. love horses, wasn't my thing. So I went into a program um, in Kingston, Ontario that yeah. did small animal as well as research animals so that you could choose. Yeah, very interesting. I yeah. had no um, experience at all with mice or rats or bunnies or guinea pigs. So it was an experience. Wow. I, I didn't choose to go into the research end of it, but you know, you could okay. kind of choose either way and usually by the end of the three years you either knew which way you wanted to go so yeah yeah but and this is interesting because i i you know what for as many years as i've known you um i've never heard these stories before mm -hmm. i i, I <laughs> didn't i didn't know that but i will tell you something that you probably didn't know is that when i was very young 
my parents, I wanted to become a veterinarian myself. Ah. And my parents took me to a local veterinarian place. And this is like, I don't know, 30 some, I was like 10 years old or something like that. And I, it, they kind of treated it like a volunteer. So I went in and I got to watch a surgery. Oh. And I remember it was a cat. And this is back then when they like completely cut open the cat for to do a spay. Mm-hmm. And um, her organs were very swollen. Like there was something wrong with her. If I remember, they told me that. But I remember I saw that and I thought to myself, I don't think I could do this because if I accidentally made a mistake and killed someone else's animal, I would feel so guilty. Like mm-hmm. I just, I couldn't do that. Um, and then at that point, I'm like, yeah, this isn't for me. <laughs> you know so anyway it, it was just uh for me it's just it's not for everybody no it's you not really no. you have to be incredibly brave when it comes to animals and i think not only do you have to have the passion and the heart for it but you also have to be like a piece of iron in a lot very, of very too, much so right? yeah, yeah 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 you have to kind of set the emotions aside and yeah like it's like human medicine as well too like yeah it's very tough nurses aren't there to hold babies all day long no no right and we're not there to pet to pet kitties and puppies all day long which people think no there's a it's a science to it it's a it's it's a medical field and that's how you have to treat it so anyway i didn't want to interrupt you so please go ahead with what you're telling everybody (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, so uh, three years in Kingston, and then I got hired right out of school back in my hometown, um, yep. full-time job. Yeah, but it was, um, it's like just the bricks, everything fell right into place. <laughs> that's so amazing. Yeah. That, that, that's just incredible. Um, so I don't know your history, and we don't have to get into your history as far as when <laughs> I first, you, you know, like, I remember um, we had a mutual friend at the clinic that mm-hmm. you were working at, and... Um, Can you, can we talk about, um, some of the stuff like, I don't think people realize what happens backstage. There's a lot more that happens behind the scenes than, yeah, than people realize. Like I said, we don't pet kitties and puppies all day long. Right, exactly. Um, There's, you know, there's, there's a surgical aspect to it, which, um, has, you know, your pre-op seems when you go in, if you were a human to go in for, um, surgery, um, there's blood work involved. There's questions that have to be filled out. There's, it's, it's a lot of prep work. And then there's, the, um, the pre-meds, the anesthetic, uh, right. the surgery, the recovery, and, right. uh, both, uh, us and the veterinarians are, are all part of that. Of course they do the surgery, but, um, right. there, there's, you know, we are, I'm not, we, we do some reception, uh, but like we're a triage nurse. Yeah. We're a surgical prep nurse, recovery nurse. We're an anesthesiologist. We do a lot of the anesthetics. I don't, yep. I don't people don't really know that, but we that's yeah. what something we train for. Um, we're laboratory technicians because we do the blood work. We we do right. some of the pathology, which is doing the blood slides to make sure yep. that all the cells in the blood are healthy. That's putting it really mildly. Um, no, that's great. But, yeah. Well, yeah. There's there's a there's a lot to it. There's a lot involved in lab work. Um, What's and, the different? Go. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, um, some people may not know what is the difference between yourself, which is a vet technologist, mm-hmm. and a vet tech. <laughs> it's just the the amount of years you train. We trained three years of the program that I went to. Um, okay. There are a couple are, that are three. Um, most of them are two. Um, it doesn't mean that we come out any different. It's just the amount of different courses you take. Like a lot of ours were research based, okay. and being a technician, you don't need research. So you have, so. as a technologist, um, more education above and beyond a vet tech then? Um, in a different correct? aspect. In a different, uh, a- in the yeah. research. Research part. aspect, yeah. In the research aspect. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I just wanted to clarify that so people do have an understanding. Mm-hmm. Because I, in fact, I didn't even know this until we were backstage and we were kind of talking about it. Um, you know, and then you clarified that. And so I'm glad that we did because, you know, I want to give credit where credit is due, right? I mean, you know, technically. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and there, there is like, um, there's, there's now, when I went to school, there wasn't a vet assistant program, which there is right now. Okay. And it's, it's a, I believe a one year program. Um, and they, they, as far as I understand, they learn a lot of the basics for animal care. And I, I know like our local veterinary emergency clinic will hire them um, to assist the techs and, and the vets. And that is such 
a great program for somebody who doesn't want to go to the extent of, you know, vet, vet technician, but to, to be able to take that to get into a vet right. clinic, there's a lot of need for it now, especially with COVID. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, now, um, do you still work, like, do you, you're semi-retired, do you still have the opportunity to go and work at some of the other clinics? I did for a bit. Um, because uh, during years, COVID? Not dur- no, not during COVID. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I did up until about three years ago. Uh, three, yeah, time is, time's gone, probably four years ago now. Um, and then I just decided that I, 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 my hands weren't in it enough to keep up on it. And, you know, right. when you're doing like one hour a month, it's not worth it. Yeah. Leave yeah. it to the pros. <laughs> the, the right, ones. exactly. Um, it must be, um, I can't, uh, so I, I have seen uh, surgeries at the mm-hmm. clinic that, you know, uh, that that you have worked at with, <laughs> and I've been fortunate enough to actually be there during the operation and I was allowed to, which is, which really doesn't happen, mm-hmm. but you know, she allowed that to happen. And, um, that was just amazing, you know, to watch. Yeah, it is. Um, it's, you know, when you watch it, it's she, for her, she makes it seem so easy when really, I don't think that I, I, you know, I can't imagine what it's really like to, um, because there's gotta be a lot of difficulties as, as well. People do lose animals on the operating Mm -hmm. table. Yep. Um, you know, not that often. I, w- I would guess. I don't really know. Um, but, you know, it's not always kitty cat and puppy dogs and rainbows backstage. Am no. I right? No. It, 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 She's very, very talented, by the way. So, you know, when when you see yeah. her operate, um, you, you're seeing the creme de la creme. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. It's... Um, it's she does make it look really easy. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, it's a, it, it's amazing. But can you tell us about, you know, some of the pressure that that goes on, you know, um, back there during the surgeries? Like, there's got to be some sort of pressure, I would imagine. And I couldn't imagine like you working now during COVID times um, when it's just got to be just twice as hard. From what I've heard from several friends who are still in the profession, yeah, it's COVID has really changed how how vet clinics have to do things. For one thing, with people not being allowed in, everything is done over the phone. So diagnosing over the phone is not an easy way to try to treat an animal. Right. I can, um, you know, the pressure on the text to go in and out, you know, getting the animal, taking it back in. Um, right. There's that's a lot of legwork which we're not used to. And then you've still got all the stuff you have to do in-house, all the lab work, all the surgery. It just, time frame wise, it, it's just not, a, it, the convenience is gone. Yeah. But, but as far as behind the scenes, surgery wise, um, yeah, older animals, especially when you've got an animal under for four or five hours to do an extensive dental where you're taking every tooth out of that animal's head, because there's yeah. disease processes that, that can cause you to have to take all the teeth out. Um, yes that animal's under a very long time. It's a lot of, and, and it's just usually you and the vet there, there's nobody to spot you off. And right. there's constantly, you know, you're doing vitals, you're doing, you might have to take blood work in between, you're monitoring blood pressure, uh, making sure the anesthetic is, it's not, they're, you, know, you know, they're not being uh, too deeply anesthetized. It's, 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 right. it's an art, but it, as you get ex- more experience, it is easier and, and you just, right. You, like any job, you learn the ropes more, but you, you still, you, you don't let your guard down. That's and and you're on your feet. It's not like you're yeah, sitting non-stop. in a chair. No. <laughs> you're nonstop. Because I yeah. know that when I have been backstage, nobody is sitting down. Like, I remember there was a chair for the yeah. computer and everybody was just do, 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 typing while they were standing up because I'm not going to say like it's not like crazy backstage. It's very incredibly well organized. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like this person moves here and this person sees this person coming and they move out of the way. Um, You know, because I noticed too, that from my memory, you don't have a lot of people and there's a, there was a really in the clinic that we're, that, you know, we're familiar with, there's a lot of space for people to kind of walk around in that big area there. Um, It's very fluid. It's incredibly fluid when you have a good dynamic team, yep. um, you know, back there. Um, you know, I, I, I now recovery, 
it's got to be really hard for uh, the animals. And I think that's, is that where most of the concern is at? Is not so much the surgery, but the recovery? Um, no, both. Um, surgical okay. recovery is more learning how to pain manage uh, because every animal is different. And some drugs work for some and some don't work. And you have to make sure you're working with the vet to make that animal as comfortable as possible afterwards. You know, we have, we have regimes that we follow, but like I said, not every pain medication works for that animal. So sometimes, you know, you're upping a dose, you're, you're changing, you're adding something in, but that's where, um, you know, the doctor's anticipating, um, this is what we're going to do in recovery. And that's where the whole team comes right. in. Um, you know, there's, there's, you, you have to make sure the animal's warm after we're heating blankets, we've got um, heating discs and things that we've made sure that, um, we've anticipated the best outcome for that right. animal post-surgical, post-surgical. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. and you talked about the, the, the dynamics of the team. It's all about anticipating the doctor's needs and the doctor anticipating um, what they'll need during surgery and everybody prepping ahead. That's how you get that fluid system working is it in, easy, in the back. Is it easier to have that, that fluid dynamics backstage when you know the doctor, because I, I, oh, I, I'm i assuming huge, that huge. Not, not all doctors work. Some of the doctors, like up here, they're called locums, where they do yeah. travel from clinic to clinic. They're yeah. mobile vets. We have a lot of mobile vets here yeah. in, in our area in Canada. Um, so I know that uh, some of the doctors will work at one clinic and then they go to another clinic, uh, depending on what's going on and how they feel and what they really want to do for work and whatever, whatever. Um, but I would imagine that it's easy. Is it easier to have that fluid dynamics with somebody that you know versus somebody that you've never worked with before? Definitely. A lot of the locums, though, yeah. because they've seen so much at so many different clinics, they're uh, very adaptable. And that's what makes it work so well. And that's why we like some locums more than others. <laughs> right. Well, of course, obviously. It well, they, they're, like I said, some, some, every clinic works differently. There's little things that yeah. you'll do differently uh, on the, you know, with the whole picture, everybody anesthetizes and recovers kind of the same sort of way. Um, but right. with different vets. Yeah. I, I, I really noticed that um, in practice, uh, certain locums that would come in would just like fit right in. Yeah. And it just it just made and everything so don't. smooth. No, no, there's some that are um I'll just say haven't worked around that in that area. Yeah. And that yeah. those, you know, maybe they're new to the area and, and they just they they go with the flow though. Personality wise though too, it's gotta be really difficult. Um, you know, like when you work with someone and you you can anticipate you, ex you she knows what to expect from you you know what to expect from her vice versa yeah um and then if you get somebody else that comes in even if they're a good veterinarian it's the personality that would i would imagine that can be difficult at times i've never run into that problem believe it or not you haven't that's nope. oh that's interesting. no no i would have that problem <laughs> i don't know I, about you but i would <laughs> I, I, I don't I work well with others I tell this story, as I've told her before, I, I said, when I, when I first started the clinic where, you know, we have a mutual, had a mutual friend, um, you know, things are just, yes. everything goes, but that's how she operates. And until I learned that, yes. um, there's no fluff, right? It's, she's just, she's, she's so good at her job and she, she's, <laughs> no, but she's, she organizes her time so well. That's why she can get so much done. And that's why she's hired right. at so many different places. She's very cost efficient, <laughs> yeah. um, but, but the, and then, you know, now we're the best friends. Yeah. It just mm -hmm. took getting yeah. over the hump and learning, but I, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't find it difficult and I didn't find her personality, uh, you know, not something I could get along with. It was just um, right. learning how she operated. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that's part of the fluid dynamics as well is when you have somebody new that comes in a new veterinarian, you kind of have to readjust. See, I was the new, new person, uh, right? I like I, oh. I, came, I came into that clinic and she was already there. She was a, no, she but was, once oh. you're, but right. But once you're established um, at, at that said clinic, and then, you know, you don't always have the same veterinarians coming into the clinic that you're working at. Yeah. So if you get a new veterinarian, that's when, um, you kind of have to readjust to that new veterinarian that's doing the surgery. Is that correct? Yes, because they everybody yeah. has the different ways of doing things, 
right? <laughs> like right. some the newer grads do things differently than the older grads, same as us techs, right? The new techs right. do things. It's just because they change the way everybody learns. Right. But but it's okay. we all learn that way. I learn new things from new vets. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's um it's it's difficult. I just it's hard for me to fathom um sometimes because I don't I, I don't see a lot of the bad stuff, you know, like when I was visiting the clinic mm -hmm. going backstage. Um it was very rare that I was around any of that you know anything bad that was happening we'll just say um there's got to be some incredibly tough stories and we don't really have to get into like necessarily specifics but can we talk about how it's how you know it must have been difficult for you um how did you deal how did you deal with that like mentally you with kinda, some of this the stuff yeah like the euthanasia there's some people who are uh, their animal is their life and they can't yeah. they can't function without them and I did run into that at one clinic and it yeah. was I, I thought we were going to have to call 911 for the woman because she was so distraught yeah. over having to put her dog down this was after an ultrasound and they found a splenic tumor yeah. and I, I to hear those noises coming out of a woman yeah. uh, it was it was awful it was, and you know, yeah, that, that you go you go into a different mode though. It's like, okay, how can I make her feel better? We need to, you know, and, and you almost go into a, a calm, a calming mode. You where, have to. It's yeah, like calming you, signals with dogs, right? Yeah, exa exactly. Yep. And if you have you're to do, calm, she's gonna hopefully be calm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you're hysterical, oh my god, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, then she's gonna, you know, it's the reaction of it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But so the, you, the, you know that to be a therapist as well. Yeah, pretty. Yeah, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of a hand holding. Counselor in a way, like a grief yep. counselor, mm -hmm. uh, which and, is incredible. But some of some of them do you in. I had one um, at one clinic, a uh, little eight year old girl, and yeah, they ended up having to decide to put her cat down, and yeah, it did me in. I was by the end of it. I I had young children at the time, and yeah. I'll never, re I, I, I still, I'll never recover from that. There's some things that you just will never forget. <laughs> you just remember. Yeah, that was one of them. And they just, then they just become triggers. Yep. It, yeah. Know? And, it, and yeah. Uh, still makes me upset. You know, I look at social media is such a big play nowadays. And yes, it is. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, I kind of, I personally feel really, get really upset because I'd see, all, like I'm part of different dog training groups and just, and, and the stuff that you see is just, uh, it's frightening. Mm -hmm. um, today, um, someone posted a video of their poodle who was just aspirating. And instead of actually calling a vet, this person, bloop, 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 do you think there's something wrong with Dr. Dog? Google? Right. <laughs> and, you know, and everybody's like, go to a vet. Why are you posting this? And why, you know, it, it happens so much. And, you know, I think to myself, you know, there, there is a lot of, I do find a lot of back talk about people like to go to the cheapest vet. Um, I was just don't go to this. Touch on yeah. That. Don't go to, <laughs> don't, don't go to this vet um, in that vet and blah, blah, blah. But you know, there's always two sides of the story. There as is. I always say, um and you know if you don't have pictures or a video then it's not proof yeah <laughs> you know um but because of the the backlash i find i don't find that people at least on social media are very empathetic towards i understand they're worried about their pet and there's something wrong with their pet um but i'm the type of person where you get a pet you be a responsible pet owner before you get that pet you make sure hey something is going to happen that's going to cost two or three thousand dollars to my dog or cat at some point in its life put some money away i have get the some funds, pet insurance yeah. yep. make sure that you have the funds because when you don't you're going to have to bring your cat or your, your your dog to an emergency vet clinic um and then when you get the bill you're in shock and then you backlash that it's all their fault, you know, or you're upset at them because something's happened to your cat. Well, they're trying, they're, they're there to help you. 
Yeah, you know? they're only and, in and, it for the money. <laughs> right. And I just feel like there's really not a whole lot of empathy towards veterinarians, um, vet technologists, and even receptionists. Like, the, I think the receptionists, I don't know, they kind of seem to get the blunt of the blow. They do. They do. In, in a way, because I've been they there do. and I've seen, they take the phone calls. They're the ones that get the harassment phone calls, the threatening yeah. phone calls, the hangups. And it's just, you know, I, for those of you who are watching, be empathetic to veterinarians and to the clinics, have some understanding, um, you know, but I don't hold that against the field. Like social media seems to do where mm -hmm. they are just, they're just so nasty about it, you know? Um, and I think to myself, instead of posting something like this on social media, oh, my dog ate some marijuana, what should I do? You know, like call your vet, you know, like that's what they're there for, you know? But it's unfortunate. It's, uh, the problem with it is, is you have to pay for veterinary medicine. You don't have to pay in yeah. Canada for your own, like for human medicine. And therein lies the problem. Yeah. Right? People don't see how much things That's cost. true, and I never thought about that. Yeah. And vets have to buy all their own equipment. They have to buy they have to buy the building. They have to pay people. They have, you know, and it's, we're not used to doing that with human medicine. So therein lies the problem with people having to actually see a bill and pay it. Yeah. If we, if we had to pay yeah. for our own, you know, medical expenses, most of us would be broke. <laughs> But. That's true. And that's a really good point because even I haven't really thought about that, um, you know, because the vets do have, I mean, when you look at a clinic, the clinic that you and I know, can we say, can Start we at the front say doors. how much that it costs? I, I, I couldn't even guess because things have changed so much, but like start at the front door. Originally it was over like a million, million dollars or $2 million Probably, or yep. something, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. And that's out of their own pocket, oh, one yeah. person or two people or whatever. Yep. yep. Um, for for a clinic that's building the building, and then the cost of the equipment, like equipment. it's crazy. It's medical it equipment, right? So you do have to charge because you do have to recoup that. We all have to make a living somehow, and they chose to that's make it correct. as a as a veterinarian instead of a doctor. Right. Yep. Yeah. That's, but it's a really interesting point that I, I never really thought of. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 we don't. No, it, it's not about that. It's just, no. it's, um, I, I really wish that, that if there's something wrong with your animal, don't post on social media, call your, call your vet clinic, you know, get some good advice. Before it's too yeah. late. <laughs> before, right? before it's too late because yeah. I, so you know that I I I just took a um, first aid in canine or yes canine, canine, canine first, first aid, aid course. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it was really interesting um, to take that. Um, I there's no way there's so much information. There's no way I think I'm back to myself. <laughs> well, I'm certified for three years. Yeah. But you know, there's only certain things that I seem to kind of remember, and um, I do know that by the time that an incident happens, whether your dog gets hit by a car or swallows something or is poison or whatever, you literally have from that point on 30 minutes before it's curtain call in most emergency critical situations. For, for some, like, like a break, that's a different story. You can stabilize yeah. till the next yeah. day. And I'm sure you learned splinting, didn't you? Right. Did you? Did. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> Yeah, we learned all that puncture wounds, mm -hmm. how to treat all of that, um, you know, the whole works. Um, I've actually got two giant medical kits. I've actually got a medical bag wow. in the trunk of my car. So, and the reason why is because, and I'm Mr. Safety, like, you know, I'm Mr. Safety, but yep. <laughs> um, I want to be prepared. And one thing that I never thought about was if, because I do a lot of hiking with Frosty, is that, um, like my instructor was saying, there's going to be a point where if it's your animal or somebody else's animal um, and you're taking care, you're doing emergency on that animal. Um, and if somebody walks by, you're going to have to grab them and say, Hey, here's my phone call 
Mm -hmm. um, my veterinarian. Well, there, and so it was interesting because during this this course, um, the instructor actually has a cell phone. She's like, "Oh, uh, what button do I push?" Like she's acting like <laughs> panic mode, right? Well, right. What button do I push? And uh, what's your vet's name? And then you're like one one thousand, two one thousand, like doing compressions, and you're like, uh, "I don't know. Uh, look under M." You know, like you don't mm -hmm. know. So she says one thing that you do because people do go in panic mode is you're a veterinarian. You should always know the nearest um, veterinary clinic, wherever you're mm -hmm. by, if possible. Um, you should always know where the emergency clinic is at, the veterinary Definitely. emergency <laughs> clinic is at. Have their numbers in. But what you do is, like if I had Maggie, for example, because I, I in my phone I have Maggie. Oh, not right. DVM. Wrong. No. Yeah. Vet, uh, because in a panic, a oh, if I right. were to give a passerby a phone, True. call my vet. Call my vet. They're going to be what name, and then I'm not going to remember. Is she under DVM? Is she under M for Maggie? Right. Or what is she under? So my instructor said, always put everything for vet under vet. So that Art. way, so I have her now as vet Maggie. You know. Yeah. Um, because you do have that panic mode. Um. But anyway, so it was just really interesting because another thing she said is too, is like, um, you're going to have to tell that person to give them the keys. Possibly you say, hey, go grab my car, drive my car mm -hmm. down here to load up my dog or what, or your dog or whatever. Um, but hey, go in my car and get the medical kit. Oh, where's the medical kit? Well, it's under the front seat. What front seat? You know, what does it look like? So you have all of this that's True. going through this person. And you're like, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. You're like, oh, shit you know mm -hmm. um so what i did and what she suggested well what i did differently because instead of having it under the front seat i have a big giant purple duffel bag so with everything that i need in it it's like mm -hmm. it's huge it's like a suitcase go on my trunk through the large purple bag go grab it and bring it to me you know easily so identifiable. that type of stuff of being <laughs> easily identifiable yeah. i don't have to worry because what happens i'm thinking is if you have a medical kit and it's under your seat and you're driving trying around, it you out. think it's underneath. <laughs> yeah. And then you're trying to pull it out. And yeah. I'm a big guy. Like I've got big arms. I can't fit my arms underneath the front seat. Fair enough. So, you know, I have to look Plan at all ahead. Those different things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Um, I really enjoyed that course. Um, and I really did learn a lot. Um, but what advice would you give to new vet techs coming into the into the industry as we kind of wrap up here? That's a good question because things have changed very much from when I graduated. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Uh, John, I really don't know what to say to that. Um, or what, what, what do you Get wish it. that you would have known? Uh, Is there anything that you wish that you would have known? No, not really. Nope. That's why I stayed in it for so long. Well, that's a good really. question. And anything I, I done, anything done differently or I moved around a lot, a, diff a lot of different clinics. Yeah. And I think that's why I stayed in it so long. The first clinic I was at, I was at for 17 years. And that's I'm really, I'm, it was a very long time. And I'm really glad that I gained the experience <laughs> from the different clinics I worked at because they were all, one of them actually was a large animal clinic. And I never, I had to tube a calf um, to tube what? feet. And the, like, like I actually put a tube down, yeah. uh, down yep. the calf. To feet, yep. Yeah. And that was an experience and a half. But I learned, I learned a lot at that clinic. Um, and I, yeah. I'll say diversify, do as much as you can, do as much continuing education as you can. Um, keep learning. Don't stay stagnant yeah. cause that's, that's when you start to hate it. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a new movement going around now. Um, because I don't know if you know, but, uh, veterinarians are the number one, uh, profession for suicide rate. Um, yeah. I just want to take, before we wrap up, I want to, yeah. I want to take like three minutes because this is incredibly important and this is something that I almost forgot about because mm -hmm. I know and I were going to talk about it. Please take a few minutes to tell us this because this is so important. This is why I believe that people, another reason why people should be 
incredibly empathetic towards your veterinarian and, and all staff at the clinic. Yeah. Well, there was a movement that started in the States because of a very prominent vet. I believe she was in New York uh, and she committed suicide and it's called um, NOMV and it has the vet um, insignia. Uh, not one more vet. Yeah. And most veterinarians are part of that group right now trying to help lean on each other as much as they possibly can because it's, it's rampant. Yeah. It's terrible. But you told me this, um, about a month ago, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's not often that I'm lost for words. And um, I, I was incredibly lost for words. And it was it was very deeply concerning to me because I, I honestly had no idea. Um, and I just want to just cap on something that I have talked to, um, you know, a little bit to somebody else about was, for me, when you're dealing with euthanasias, um, and you're a mobile, and you're a mobile vet. You have to have that game face on. Can you imagine the feeling of going over to a friend's place um, or a very good client putting their animal down that you've taken care of for years? Mm -hmm. You've known these people personally, and they're weeping and they're crying. And you have to be that 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 therapist at that point but you have to be incredibly strong and you have to know exactly what to say at the right times. Exactly. And then guess what? Now you have to be somewhere else in 20 minutes and you're giving a 12, 12 week old puppy shots yep. and you walk in and you have to have this game face on of, Oh, everything. Oh yeah. Oh gosh. You know, when really deep sound deep down inside you're, you're literally you just want to cry. Broken. <laughs> yep. You know, and that is really tough because, I know when I hear stories from either, you know, uh, veterinarians or like yourself, you and I have talked about this. Um, for me, when you tell the story, it's like, okay, so that animal has passed. And then that's kind of it. I never thought, and not like I'm selfish or anything, but it's never really, I never dwelled on what that must be like for someone in the field that has to do that. Like it's the same time thing for, after time for, for, after for you. Time. Mm -hmm. time after it's got to be so incredibly draining it is mentally draining and physically draining that it, just, it makes you feel sick having to you know go through that um and when i when i hear about this and those people that i'm interacting with are, are literally crying and they're tearful because it's so incredibly hard to do that's why when you told me I really took a step back and I was just like, I had no idea. And well, that's when I started thinking about it. Like it's crazy. After that one episode, I told you about the little girl with the cat. Yeah. I, I actually, I left the profession for seven years. Yeah. I just, I, it, 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 I was done. <laughs> and we it all was have, done. that was like, I, yeah. I was done. You, you have to recognize that though. And that's, I, I gave it time yeah. and I came back. Yeah, but it's yeah, no, it is. It's yeah, it's, tough. it's 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 incredibly hard. Um, and I'm a pretty strong willed person, but I don't think I can do what you do. Just I don't have it in me. Um, and, you know, you're very courageous and it takes a lot of effort and it, it's it's very tough. And so I hope people see this, mm -hmm. watch this and have some empathy towards just everybody that works in, in clinics, whether you like the veterinary or not, they still got a tough ass job. It's a to tough do. job. Hope, you know, um, yeah, you know, but, um, until you've walked Carolyn, a mile in their shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, um, I really would like to thank you again for coming on the show. Um, it's you are an incredibly amazing person. Thank you. <laughs> um, you have helped me with my animals as well. Yep um and you know it's always a pleasure just to, to to talk to you and i hope that we can have you on again soon that'd be great um and um you know i'd love to have some more conversations with you about dog parks and all sure. sorts of fun stuff <laughs> so thank you uh, very much for coming on i greatly appreciate it and don't forget to like and subscribe to the sean shepherd show that's a wrap <laughs> stick around okay